Good morning, everyone here at the Investing Stuff You Should Know podcast. We have a pretty cool guest with us today, uh, another mechanical engineer. I know you, I know the audience uh, knows that I have a bias and like those kind of people. I uh, love having them on. They're precise, they're technical. Uh, and Patrick is kind of another level of uh, ex- expert in the investing, the real estate space. And I love his, uh, if you follow any of the, uh, some of the online uh, syndicators and multifamily panels, Patrick has made appearances on there and always has something very valuable to add. So Patrick, thank you for uh, being here with us today. Glad to be here, Johnny. Looking forward to uh, having this chat with you. Fantastic, man. So um, we know that, uh, or just to share with the audience, you uh, you know, you started your life as a mechanical engineer. I think even that, that still goes on today. Um, but then how, uh, what, what does snag Patrick uh, to look at the, this alternative space called real estate investing? Well, actually, so I'm full-time real estate, you know, so I, I did, oh, well, that's I don't know if that makes me uncool and if I can still be on your then. podcast <laughs> or not. Very but. close. I should have had, I should have screened better. Yeah. It's like when I went from electrical engineering to mechanical, I said, I saw the light and electrical guys said, I saw a black light. Right. And now I'm going from mechanical to real estate. I don't know what I'm looking at now, but it's <laughs> so I mean, there's a lot of similarities, honestly, in the way that we do real estate to the way that we analyze engineering problems, and or at least in my 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 mindset. But, um, shoot, what was your question? It was, it was oh yeah, sure, be- yeah. So what what is that? What what? Is, so like obviously, like you know, we were both like career guys, and I left my mm-hmm. you know uh, full time uh, engineering job about nine months ago, and it sounds like he re- recently left as well. But also, there was some point in our history where so- something grabbed our attention, like oh, I need to I need to invest in real estate too. And then also, that, oh yeah, that was, well, yeah. And, and and so my my story goes back a little ways. Uh, my first deal was back in two thousand seven, uh, in real estate, and six just six and seven. And I had been a in a snot nosed mechanical engineer at a machine design automation and robotics company. I continued to be a snot nosed mechanical <laughs> after that, but I had been about, only in the about. engineering world a couple of years before the owner of the company I was working for, uh, Dave Carlberg, uh, just genuine guy, love him to death. Yeah. Um, he told me I needed to invest as soon as I can and as much as I can into real estate. And while cognitive rewarding and fun is high tech and automation and robotics and, and we'll be in a, we were involved in all kinds of stuff, satellites, medical devices. I mean, all over the place. Yeah. That's, and, that's, that's cool stuff. I mean, careful. Yeah. We're, we're going to nerd out and geek and the rest of the podcast will be on that, but yeah. So be careful there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so then I did it. I, I, you know, I did some research and I was like, oh, I'm young. Let's get aggressive. Let me, let me go big. Let me take that chip, slide it over to green 24 and spin the wheel. <laughs> You know, I actually did a lot more analysis than that. And I, I got into what is a pre-development and what should have been pretty sure bet, uh, personally guaranteed it. And I did, I did drive, I did get raked over the coals, drug through the gutter pretty bad. And, uh, and the following years, 9, 10, 11, came crawling out of that a few years later, learned about recessions, learned about resilient markets, learned about recourse loans, about debts, and learned about buying for cash flow and, yeah. and buying in the right locations and yeah. building a diversified, sustainable portfolio. And I was convinced the tortoise will outpace the hare. So that's what led me down the single family by existing construction instead of new construction pre-development and um, trade from there into larger multifamily deals in recession resilient markets. So. Awesome. And so let's, uh, and I want to, uh, you know, double click into that here. So there was, a, there was an analogy that I was going to use here. Maybe it's good, maybe it's not, but you know, we know uh, some of us have known uh, people like our maybe our grandparents, great grandparents that lived through the depression, and they had this very, very saving mentality. You know, as a maybe back when we were like real, real young. You know, like I went to save cash, and that's how they invested. Or they basically that was, that was that's all they did. So they would just save. They didn't spend a lot, and they saved. I feel like folks like yourself that have lived through a hard times have a fundamentally different perspective and philosophy on um, on how to invest. And I'd love to, like to, I'd like you to share that, uh, the School of Hard Knocks and also your different lens that you view uh, how to invest. But if you could share that with the audience, uh, I would love to, to hear that uh, and contrast that with what you, a lot of, you, you see a lot in newer syndicators and new operators. Uh, if you could elaborate on that, your own personal philosophy borne out by hard, hard one knowledge. Yeah, you know, I've, I've talked and you probably saw a couple of my panels because uh, you know, I was talking on economics in Chicago recently and a couple of virtual ones. And, 
I, and it's the truth that that a lot of the stuff I look for and the questions I ask, if I'm talking to a newbie, oftentimes they don't even understand the question. They, they, they don't know what I'm asking and why I'm asking it. And um, what are some like what are two two questions that, that that hit people the newbies? What that you can always tell like it's a brand new person. What are the questions yeah. you ask? And well, so I look at. The, I want to make sure I can. Talk. I want to make sure when I if you, when we meet, then I can answer the question. I don't want to look. Okay, down. right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know ahead the question. Yeah, you talk about stress testing. You talk about break even occupancies. Yes. Um, and so I talk about what are the uh, stress tested break even occupancies over the course of the strategy, right? And yeah. and because I they're like, oh, it's this leverage and blah 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 blah. But I want to know at the end of the day in the market that they're at, where the market vacancies have fallen in prior recessions. And are you structuring this deal with the right kind of debt long enough to withstand a rebound that's typical in that market and a vacancy that's typical in that market? And, and then the, and as a, a, I don't, first of all, you've got to be built on a strong foundation. And if you know a property occasionally floods, you've got to fortify that foundation above the flood zone. Right. And so similarly, if you're putting a deal together, you got to fortify that deal to weather the storms that have come and that may come in the future. And oftentimes they're they're just so stuck in, oh, we got this rent bump, it's unrenovated, da 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 da. da. The stress testing component is is a whole strategy that should be done first, that should be looked at as a primary driver, primary criteria for the deals. And what is uh and so that somebody might counter Patrick, they say, well, I, you know, I, I would never get any deals done or like it's, it's uh, so much work and so many, there's so many variables and, you know, what's your, what's your, what's your rejoinder to that, that kind of like a little bit kind of. If you can't bit, find a deal bit, that yeah. can ride out <laughs> another recession, you shouldn't be doing the deal. Yeah. I think it's a very backwards perspective. It took me two and a half years when I decided to trade from single family and a multi to find the right kind of deals and the right kind of markets with the right kind of partners and structure them in the right kind of way. So just be patient. Yeah, you work harder. I, 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 love that. I love that patience idea. Let's let's uh, let's elaborate on these. You mentioned four things there: the right, you know, the right, the right, the right, the right, like that. Uh, mm -hmm. What is what is the right uh, what is the right market for you? Well, so like I said, I I look for for example in Houston. When if you look at the past recessions, it's got diversified employment that has shown built-in insulation. Yes. from market volatility, a diverse set of employment. It's not a Detroit or a mining town. Right, or even in Orlando, where it's heavily weighted in recession-affected service and hospitality tourism. Right, it's got you've got logistics. You do have some oil, which is on a completely different market cycle. Yeah. But you've got the largest life science center in America in the world. Actually, the busiest life science center in the world is in wow. Houston. I didn't know now, that. It's got and aside from the energy, it's got the high tech. Right, and you've got logistics. So you've got all these different uh, and education which is a very strong presence there. Got all these different pillars, which have shown us, so if you look at past downturns, you saw that the Houston drove on a similar strong tried and true growth curves. Yeah. And then in eight, nine and 10, it actually leveled off. Didn't even dramatically fall before it started going up in a couple of years later. Other markets that were very high tech and manufacturing based like, like uh, Phoenix, it took yeah. 12, 15 years for it to just barely recover. Once wow. Ones like Vegas, hospitality, right? Tourism, 12 years to recover. And you saw some 70% vacancies in those markets. You didn't yeah. see that in other markets, right? That's, Dallas that's very, is another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very practical, very practical knowledge. So you mentioned like that diversity, the uncorrelated <laughs> type of industries to like, again, mm -hmm. like if someone's to listen to this and I want them to walk away with like, okay, how does Patrick look, view the world? And yes, you gave us a concrete example, which is fantastic, but then like that's such key actionable item there. Um, so then moving to another one that you mentioned, what is in your mind uh, or your definition, what is the right team, Patrick? Oh, well, so, and I said this on a panel recently that I did. I said, I said, what's interesting is everybody on this panel that's brave enough to talk about how to do economic, how, how to do deals in today's economics, all of us have been through a downturn. Yes. Right? And, and, and that to me is the right kind of, is the right kind of team. Somebody who's failed. And, and we come from the high tech space, Johnny, and in Silicon Valley, where I was educated. Yeah. Um, and I started out a lot of the venture capitalists and a lot of the startups, they won't invest in CEOs that, that haven't failed before. One, failure because is a huge thing. they don't, they're not humbled. Right. Yeah. 
too, because they don't know how that person behaves during the failure, right? Yes. I didn't go bankrupt. I fought hard through it. I ended up doing debt forgiveness and fell through foreclosure, but I was able to maintain and I, I ponied up where I could and how I could. And then it, and I stayed at the table. I didn't go dark. I didn't hide. Actually, I hired, I hired an attorney to go hunt down the lender because it was bought and sold three times, right? So you want to see how the people had behaved, how they operated. Did they stay in communication? Did they fight their way out of that hole? And how did they recover? Did they, are they back in the game? And, yes. and that's because communication and how people, and I think that that's the most important thing we, is, is have, have they seen failure and in and, and a failure? And oftentimes I'll ask that to my sponsors if I'm, if I'm either partnering or I'm at, so, hey, when, when did things go really south for you? What's the situation with your properties? Are you distributing? And then what's your communication been like? And what you'll find is that sometimes I'll hear, oh, you know, we didn't really have anything to say because it wasn't good news. I'm like, well, no, that's, that's, that's not right. Yes. So with sponsors, I look first, like, are they, are they, for, for us, where are they calculated and are they gut, are they gut feel or are they calculated? Are they measuring a market model? Are they modeling the markets? Are they applying volatility to their, to their deals? And then it's, are they low leveraged, right? And are they conservative? Are they putting in long-term debt? Are they under, are they under promising and over delivering consistently? And I would rather, uh, like, for example, we're, you know, we, we're buying a property at five and a quarter million discount instead of leveraging at the hilt, you know, we're doing lower leverage instead of, uh, getting a loan for all the CapEx, we're raising the CapEx. And instead of taking the six to 800 rent bumps in the comparable set, we're only showing in the modeling three to 400 rent bumps. And yes. by year three, instead of saying, Hey, the market's, you know, going to stay flat and the cap rates are going to stay consistent. Right. We're actually saying, well, maybe what happens if the market, if the cap rates inflate, which means the prices go down, right? Well, so we're actually modeling in a year to year inflation. So we're not hoping, we're not buying and then just hoping that the yeah. market drives us. We're not buying, leveraging it to help, squeaking every last penny out of the deal and then putting a best case projection. We're actually putting, if there's a market downturn, this is how the deal will pencil. Yeah. Right. A question that pops into mind right then, Patrick, or right there, Patrick, is, and this is a little bit from a different perspective of a, um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, just partners, I guess more of maybe on the GP side, is then mm -hmm. how can you guys, what is your secret sauce then that you can execute on when you don't like max out the leverage and, you know, do like max out the, the rent bumps and like, you mm -hmm. know, take advantage of all the, you know, the things that, you know, I guess from like a stock market perspective, like you didn't op you didn't keep investors maximum returns in mind, but, but then it's like the answer to that, of course, is like, well, we have longer term vision, we have sustainable sustainability, we have, you know, uh, safety in mind, you know, so that's kind of your, that'd be the answer there. So how do you guys then execute, um, find and, and make these deals work then having this more, the safer approach? Yeah. Well, so there's two pieces, I think, to that, right? One is uh, finding the deals, right? And, and that is- So a strong, a robust methodology and process to find, the, mm -hmm. find good deals. Yep. And it's relationships for the most part. Yeah. Most of the deals that come around, when they come to us, it's literally like finding that needle in a haystack. There's yes. a couple hundred to 300. And I got the sun rising here right behind me if you're on video. So I see that. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, it actually makes you look a little bit angelic, Patrick. So just, yeah. <laughs> just, just, bask, just go ahead and bask in that. <laughs> right. I'm feeling it right now. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's finding the right kind of deals and it's working harder. I mean, a lot of the, you know, sometimes I, I'll talk to newer guys and they're like, oh, I found a deal. And I'm like, what is, what do you mean? The brokers told me it's a pocket listing or the broker told me it's off market. Well, all that means is the broker uh, talked to an owner and said, would you be interested in selling? And then and the, broker, and, the, and the owner said, maybe, why don't you give me uh, what you think you could sell it for? And then the broker just sends it out there. So that's actually not under contract by the broker. There's a lot of quote off market deals or pocket lists, really not deals. And so it's, it's about working harder, finding uh, to sift through the nonsense. And once you, the broker sees that you're a no nonsense guy, then they're going to bring you the right kind of stuff. And then when you develop a track record of closing, then they're going to bring you the ones that they need you to close because it's a distressed operator. It's a distressed owner and they need you to close it. And you got to stick to your guns. Regardless of that, you got to give a price you can follow through with, right. which means you're still giving them prices below what the broker wants. And then typically 
that means they give it to the next guy, but then that guy may falter and then come back to you. Maybe one out of 10 or one out of 50, but it only takes one every now and then for a business to be had. And so it's about working a lot harder and being a lot more patient on the deal side. And then being a reputation for a closer. When a broker brings something to you, the fees that he's going to get is what puts food on the table for his family. And if he fails to close, the owner's going to be pissed. Maybe he uses them one more time. Maybe that's it, right? And so you've got to stick with that broker. You've got to you got to deliver on the price that you gave, which means you got to do the work up front. I, I flew. We were living in Oahu uh, through COVID, and I was literally red eyeing out on the you know it was lay flat seats. wasn't too rough, but it was tiring. Yeah. Yes. You know, like from Oahu to Houston, it's like six to or Florida or you know wherever else. Charlotte, I mean, it's like six to nine hours from California to, it's just pretty rough. And I mean, I would show up and I, I would walk those units and I would check those, I would check those deals out firsthand. And then, I, I mean, I remember walking three different properties in Houston, flying back with my tail between my legs and being like, no, this is a bad deal. Right. Wow. And then of course, lot. the more you, of course, then there's a built-in incentive, the more you do that, then it's like the team's waiting on this. Like, I think we, I think we can make this work. We, we've, we waited too long. Right. Yeah. Maybe we tweak this, maybe we tweak that. Right. And so that's, that's the general tendency. But, but I said, once you, if you, if you're an engine, if you think about it systematically and you stay very disciplined in your ways, then they'll start only giving you stuff that won't waste their time to air your time. And then once you can close on a deal and then use a broker on the sale, now you've made a partner that will build a career. So that's on the deal side. And, And we've gotten deals from lenders, um, we had one property in Houston where uh, it was a 19% bad debt. The guy stopped taking care of the property. It was a stack of unanswered maintenance requests, as thick as a ream of paper, you know. And I flew out there. We walked. It was just t- I, I. The guy really pissed me off. Yeah. Um. Super. But in, at the end of the day, it's a cleaner, safer, and improved living experience for the residents because he lost his building and we took it over. And he and so the lender told us about that one. We had one. Uh. It was just a lot of different ways that we hear about deals, but. On the other side, and it's about finding more patient investors. Mm, I like no that. matter any, I like that. Yeah, and that's the other side. It's about finding like-minded. It's working harder to finding ones that if we project a 15, 16, or 17, or 18 IRR, but they look at the deal and and they see that there's upside if the market goes north. There's upside if we get all the way to the rent bumps. There's upside if we're able to get a tighter expense ratio than we're projecting. There's the the underwriting is conservative in a way where every step of the way we see upside and they see, well, what's the downside? Well, the way that they leveraged this, the way that they put the debt on this and they fixed it and they're paying an extra million for a cap or they've got fixed interest rates. You know, they in fact, if there's a market dip, if the market slowdown. The, there's the, the downsides less. We'll be able to hang on to this building. We got a 65% break even occupancy, which means we can have 35% vacant right. and still pay our bills. Right. Well, and we've put an extra reserve account on top, which is an extra million, two million, six months worth of operating expenses. We can float the property for six months that we just put in a savings account. Investors were like, well, where's that? Well, you, you're going to raise that for me? That's just going to lower my return. Well, that's not the, you're not, you're not the investor for me. I want an investor that's willing to take a reasonable return and instead of squeaking every last little penny out of it. So that even if we hit the bottom of a market and we're at our break even occupancy and then a building burns down or then a tornado hits, we still have a million, $2 million in the bank to rebuild while we wait for the insurance to provide for replacement costs and loss of rents. Let's talk about. So let's, we, yeah, let's talk about. Uh, I, I like, you, and you kind of mentioned at the beginning there, finding those pet, those uh, patient investors, uh, Patrick. Well, let's talk about that. So something else we we talk about a lot on the show is is capital raising, of course. And then you know, typically we're going out and finding uh, people with capital, people with with uh, you know maybe additional, uh, you know, maybe they're high net worth people, or they have uh, you know, have a lot of they have a high W two income, and then they're looking to put some of that passively into these types of investments here. How do you know? And what is, how, how, how do you attract those people? How do you attract those kind of patient investors that reflect? And I love this business model that you've laid out 
this patient, more diligent, uh, careful way of, of investing. And then of course it needs to be matched with this whole uh, set of investors that want to see that. How do you attract those people? Uh, well, so, uh, how, so how back, have so, you done it? Yeah. yeah so in my past, you know, um, you know, we, cause all of our deals, we have a couple partners on, and we all kind of chip in on the capital. And it's important when you get the right partner, they're going to have the right investors, right. Too. And that's another piece. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've raised almost $50 million in the last couple of years for deals from these kinds of investors. Right. And, uh, so I started machine design automation and robotics and then got into single uh, pre-development tanked and then single family I could do with all my own money. And then when I made the bridge to something that would scale and I did my first 86 unit deal um, from three bedroom, one bath, two bath to 86 units, you know, like, yes. the engineering calculus was very, nothing in here makes sense, only is here. But with here, I've got to use, you know, other people's capital because I don't have enough, right? Right. I can 1031 exchange my single families up into these multifamily deals, which we do a lot of for landlords uh, that are dealing with tenants, toys and trash and want to trade up as a partner. Yeah. Um, but I need to get other investors. So I started reaching out to not family and friends necessarily, yeah. but co friend colleagues uh, from my automation and my master's. I have a master's in engineering and business. I started reaching out to people who I'd worked with on the engineering side, the high tech side, uh, entrepreneurs, owners, you know, vendors, you know, that kind of stuff and said, Hey, so I've worked on projects with you before that have been more volatile, more risky, new development, innovation stuff, but hey, I'm working on for, what are you doing for your portfolio? Cause I have some real estate stuff that is a much sure bet, very resilient. It'll be there in a market crash when we're all, waiting to, to come out of it on the high tech space. And that was very powerful because I had developed sort of a respect um, in that area as delivering on some very challenging um, projects, you yeah, know, that's, and no, so I, I was that. able to- That's very, yeah. very compelling message, the, the linking of the two here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also that, that delivery uh, of, yeah, just, I guess, uh, uh, elaborate if you would just a little bit more on, and yes, you, you brought, so you just like have that comp casual conversation or would you say, I mean, it's cause like me, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to pitch uh, you know, ex colleague or whatever on this, like, do you want to real estate invest? And I feel like I'm, you know, on TV, like, Hey, do you want to like, you know, invest with me on late night TV, you know? Uh, but the way you said that just right now is like very, uh, very natural, very you know, mm -hmm. compelling as well. How did you bridge that in your own mind of like, Hey, I know we've worked on you know, we're engineers, professionals, we're, we're in the space and maybe a completely another space. How did you bridge that gap in your own mind? Or just maybe just natural for you to like, Hey, I know we, we, we like robots and, and uh, programming, but what about real estate? How did you bridge that? Well, similar to real estate, uh, high tech space was also a good community of people. And I've always been a community builder. Yes. Even my birthday before COVID, at least my birthday every year was 12 years in a row of taking like 30 of my friends, 30, 40 of my friends up to the wine country in Northern California for a wine tasting trip. Like I've always, and that was three days, uh, uh, Thursday night, Friday, I had three nights. It was an amazing time. And so I've always been that kind of community builder. Yeah. And I would bring people from my work, from my school and, you know, and, and all my friends and, and the same thing in the automation world, I'm always out there kind of, let's do dinners, let's do lunches, let's catch up, let's talk, let's, let's build uh, a lifelong friendships with individuals. And so I had a series where I had been saying, oh yeah, so I, you know what I did is I, I took some of my bonuses and I dumped it into a single family home and I did this. And I said, what are you doing? And so um, it had been a progression. It got to the point where then, then when I had several people investing, you know, I, and I was like talking to others, I was like, hey, you know, such and such and I are working on a real estate deal together. Yeah, right, right. You know? And then doing the kind of relation. So what are you doing? And I was, I was in, I was sincerely interested because even today I'm not entirely in real estate um, and I'm not entirely in high tech. And we actually also have an oil and gas fund, right? Yeah. Cause we're doing, you know, and, and because diversified D-linked recession resilient investments is what I'm about. And so somebody's interested in that, give me a call. I, and, and somebody else is doing something else. I love to learn. Right. But so I did that. And so it got to the point where it's kind of like the social, um, within my inner group of trusted people that I knew for greater than 15 years and then greater than 10 years and then greater than five years. And then it was their friends or their colleagues. And then, then what happened was that 
that kind of was uh, not powerful enough. And I started getting my name out there. I started doing podcasts. I started talking about recession resilient investing, inflation hedge investing, protecting against interest rate increases. I, I wrote this, I wrote a book, Amazon number one best selling with some great guys. There's Def Leppard. I'm, and you can have a free copy of this if you go to investonmainstreet.com slash book. And um, we'll put, that, we'll we'll put that in the, we'll put that link in the show notes for, for you, Patrick. Yeah. But yeah, you, sure to check that use out. Use promo both. code Johnny for that yes. one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just put the promo code Johnny, invest on mainstreet.com slash book. Persistence, pivots, and game changers, turning challenges and opportunities. NFL, NBA players, Russell Gray for the real estate gate guys, uh, lead guitarist and Def Leppard, Phil Collins. Really fun. I did that. I write for Forbes. I got a half dozen or almost a dozen now articles in Forbes. I saw that, man. That was pretty exciting. Yeah, I saw that. Like, oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and then I started getting asked to talk on stages. And, you know, and I, st- I had my head to the grinding stone. Nobody knew about me for 13, 14 years in real estate, right? It was just, and then all of a sudden I realized, well, you know what? I want to scale. I need to use other people's money. I need to attract the right kind of people. Let me get let me get my message out there. And yeah. it was a little scary. Um, and because obviously I was still doing automation and robotics. Yeah, it was scary but, in the sense of Patrick of like, uh, you know, what would your professional colleagues think of you? You know, talking on panels was that the scary part? What what was scary personally for you? Well, first of all, I've identified as an engineer my whole life yes. and a high tech guy, right? And now all of a sudden I realize. The people are like, wow, he's, he's got, I mean, right now we're at like over 500 million in real estate, right? Yeah, Holdings. that's incredible. Yeah. Yes. And so the, my, the mental shift in people's mind are, well, that's not a side gig. That's your new gig. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, and so that happened, right? And he's, they're, were, they're you, right. Were, you, were you concerned about like, I guess, like the, the, yeah, I guess the dissonance there that people might perceive of you may be professionals like, well, but that doesn't make sense. Like he's actually in real estate. He's easy. He can be committed to the project. Was that part of that fear as well? Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, well, I mean, I, I, I wanted to continue to do engineering and I, it took me a while cause I was real estate was always kind of like a fun side project. And I have always had fun side projects, but then when I started going all in, I started talking on stages, I was admitting to myself that I was, I was doing more in this now than engineering. Yes. I was writing in, articles I was speaking on panels I was I was which I was doing to a smaller extent engineering but this is now my primary gig and there was kind of like a journey I went through and I talked to some friends of mine who made it out of engineering became entrepreneurs in other areas how did you guys you know go through this transition it's a little bit but you know what when I when I finally made the leap over and you know I never looked back I mean it's what's great about real estate is not only are you making a cleaner, safer, and improved living experience for the residents, which is a core value of us, ours and all of our decks, and that's part of getting the right kind of investors because we, we spend money for that. You know, part of the return goes to improving the communities we're in. Um, you also get to return great returns to the investors and build long-term legacy wealth in a tax advantage and inflation hedged way. But the other piece is we get to work, Johnny, in this great community of multifamily abundance mindset, great people of like-minded investors. And we get to network and talk and, and share our stories and our journeys. And so it's kind of like a win-win-win in this space. And it really drew me in. Every yeah. step I made to get further and further out of my, my hobbit hole, yes. I was just more and more in the light until now I'm basking in the sunrise, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's such a good analogy with actually what's happening there. So uh, that's, that's great, man. Hey, and just, and just to share, I have the same kind of struggle and journey as well. You know, you're, you're jumping on, you know, Facebook or LinkedIn or, or sharing with people at events, uh, maybe even colleagues actually at work. And I was reluctant. I didn't know how quite to, how I would be perceived and what other people might think. And like, you know, are, are they seeing that I'm on the way out and this, that, and the other. So I, I also, not that I went in the same journey, but I mean, a similar uh, path that I, we all, you know, had to explore and uh, commit to myself. And, uh, you know, nine months ago, of course, like I said, I, I left my, my, my corporate job, um, but also it, de- it definitely is a journey and that I love that you nailed that key point of what do we identify with, you know, and yes, we have this uh, persona we built up in our minds and our heads and, um, Oh, that's the same thing, mind, head, whatever. But uh, that's what we identify with. So we have to like decouple and tear mm-hmm. that apart and say, hey, I'm now a real estate investor or I'm new, now an entrepreneur, um, you know, that, that type of thing. And that's, uh, that's challenging to people. That's very challenging. 
also to your other half right oh yeah for sure yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah so, my, <laughs> my what my first message to my wife about us doing quote real estate investing was not well received you know and i'd been like into p- bigger pockets and and reading this uh, different things and of course that's something i was caution uh people against as well so make sure you're your spouse is coming along with you on your journey, uh, that they're not too far behind. Uh, and especially if you grew up in a traditional house where it's like, yes, get a, you know, go to school and get a degree and, and et cetera. Um, and that's just quite a, you know, there's like throwing your grenade in that whole architecture, mm-hmm. that whole hierarchy of how we are supposed to do our lives. And also it's like, no, I'm going to be an entrepreneur or, or in business, you know, which is real estate is just simply a business, you know? Uh, and that's very, uh, you know, that's a, it's just a seismic shift in, in, in the, how to, you know, how that, that, that whole framework. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I hundred percent, and I can tell you that it wasn't any different over here because <laughs> okay. the, I, I actually, so I've traveled a lot. I've been, I don't know, somewhere between eighth and a quarter of the world's countries at this point. Uh, wow, I've, man. Oh. I've been, I, and so I met, uh, so I've been very, I just loved immersing into the international cultures and, my, I met my wife who's from Beijing in California when she was going to Cal Arts to get her master's in animation. Wow. And I was just so intrigued. And I had spent a lot of time in China. Turns yeah. out we like some of the same foods like Chindu hot pot and stuff. And <laughs> we, you know, and so we, we hit it off. And that was actually when that was like, she was there for my last single family closing. And I was like, I can't moonlight my wife. I've got to, I've got to make time. And so I, that's, that's literally why I stopped doing the single family journey. And I was like, on the other side of it, I traded it up into something that was more sustainable and scalable and lower risk and multifamily. And so in her world though, in China, her parents worked in the job, literally that their family said, this is what you're going to do. Your dad's going to be a doctor. And he worked, he's still a doctor. Yes. He wanted to be a computer scientist, but no, he's a doctor. And you work until the government says, you're stop, you, you stop now. And then we pay you until you die. And that's it. And so there's no such thing as financial freedom. There's no such thing as passive income. There's no such thing as like a vision board. There's just this thing as any of this stuff. And so when we started going to conferences and I started bringing my wife with me, bringing her on the journey, yeah, these things were brand new, wow. trying to explain I mean, even, it to her even, parents. Even more, even more so, Patrick. I mean, like like literally cultural ba- barriers, you know, you were smashing through that or trying to smash through that. So holy smokes, that's, that's, that, uh, tr- that, yeah, that journey for you guys was, must have been, you know, very steep. Yeah, well, and when, you know, and it was, it was not... The analytics, which won won the story. It wasn't here's the and even though she's brilliant at math, but you know, and and animation all at the same time. And now she works for the as a production manager for feature length animated studios. She's very driven. Yes. And like a way up there at Disney DreamWorks and Nickelodeon and stuff. And awesome, man. It, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So she's very driven. But even with and she's good at math, but it, it wasn't the analytics which really drew that, broke that down. It was when we went to a conference and she started seeing the possibilities for our life on the other side of it. It was more, yeah. it was more the mindset shift. And then she came home one day and created a vision board. And mm-hmm. that's when I had her on the journey, but pushing like side by side, let's do this. We're going to make this happen. Right. You know, all of a sudden, and it was just such a cool transition to see make happen. That's a great one. And that's a, that's a great point to just to wrap the show up on that, that, that high family note. Uh, we each share something uh, personal, and, but it's also powerful and it's also relevant to a lot of professionals that you and I know on uh, how that can happen. You know, we, we, a lot of people don't even know about this. We're both passionate about the educational piece of sharing this to other, you know, whether it's STEM professionals or beyond. And uh, yeah, it's, it's so powerful to then sh- have your, jur- your spouse come on the journey and uh, then share it with other couples, other families, and just spread the word and, you know, enable this type of, uh, yeah, this type of very powerful uh, financial freedom. That's what I, that's what I think of it as. Absolutely. Anyway, so man, so uh, what's the best p- place for people to get in contact with you? Uh, I was on your website, the fantastic website, it's tons of education. Uh, share that with us and any other things you want to promote as we wrap this up. Yeah, investonmainstreet.com. That's invest on main and then street, all spelled out.com. As he said, we have a passive investor guide. We also have a bunch of investor resources there for you, as well as our latest investment opportunity at the top. You can opt in. Um, I'd love for you to set up a meeting. Uh, if you go to investonmainstreet.com slash calendar, you can set up a meeting with me. We can chat. 
if you go to the book page that we're going to put in the show notes, we will send a signed hard copy of this Amazon number one best-selling book. I believe in the content, so many great stories from successful people doing incredible things. And, and I'm in there as well. Actually, I have a wig on here on the cover page. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Back when I had hair a year ago, <laughs> I, I uh, <laughs> took that picture. But anyways, I would love uh, to sit down with you. That, good thing you got that pick in time. <laughs> yeah, wherever you're at in your journey, I'd love to um, I'd love to have a chat and see if I could contribute. Awesome, awesome, man. Um, so yeah, that, that, that'll, do, that'll wrap it up here for us, folks. Uh, we thank you for listening to another Investing Stuff You Should Know podcast. Give us a like, subscribe, uh, give us a genuine comment. Um, hopefully it's nice, but if not, then let me know. I want the feedback as well. So we can continue to uh, have great guests, uh, intelligent guests, guests that really have a lot to share like Patrick with us. So until that time, thanks all.